Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. The history of the Jewish people is long and complex. It's among the longest and most complex stories one could try to tell. It's a fascinating story, and a story that people could, and frequently have, spent lifetimes studying. It's also a story that I am far from qualified to discuss with any real depth, and it's a story that's deeply personal to millions of people the world over. Therefore, it can be a dangerous story to tell. Many aspects of the story are unhappy. And for a person not of Jewish heritage, it can be easy to misstep while telling that story. To anyone for whom this story is deeply personal, any missteps that I might make, be they historical or religious or simply pronunciation mistakes, I'd like to apologize beforehand. That's just my ignorance showing. The story of the Jewish people in regard to pirates and piracy, well... Originally, that story begins in the 1st century BCE, in the works of the Romano-Jewish historian Titus Flavius Josephus. Now, you may know of Josephus. He was a scholar and a historian working out of Jerusalem in the 1st century CE. That's a fairly important time and place in world history, and much of what we know of that time and place is thanks to Josephus. And right here is my first very good opportunity to misstep. Josephus, and forgive me if I slip up and call him Josephus, was born Yosef ben Metityahu, and he was, even in his time, a controversial figure. His Roman name, Titus Flavius Josephus, is due to his working, at one point in his life, with the Roman Empire and Roman emperors. However, our first mention of Jewish pirates comes from the works of Josephus. He wrote of Jewish and Arabian pirates operating from the eastern Mediterranean. They would have been part of the first great pirate empire, what they call the Cilician pirates. The pirates that captured the young Gaius Julius Caesar may have had among their number many Jews. They were certainly among those pirates that caused so much trouble for the Roman Republic. So much trouble, in fact, that Pompey Magnus, well, he got his name Magnus the Great when dealing with those Cilician pirates. That's a story worth telling one day, but not today. The Jewish pirates that concern us today are the New World Jewish pirates of the 16th and 17th century. However, they also have their roots in the writings of Josephus. He wrote in 75 CE the books of the history of the Jewish war against the Romans. Now that's a chronicle of the first Romano-Jewish war. That's the first major Jewish rebellion against the Roman Empire. Yosef ben Metityahu was the commander of the forces of Galilee, and he was the first main target of the Roman emperor, Nero. Nero sent one of his top commanders, Titus Flavius Vespanianus, in command of the 5th and 10th legions to put that rebellion down. Now, he had some initial success, but he was soon reinforced by his son Titus. Titus commanded the 15th legion, and he was fresh off a campaign in Britannia putting down Boudicca's rebellion, and he was well acquainted with this sort of anti-insurgent fighting. Vespasianus, better known as Vespasian today, and his son Titus would both go on to be emperors themselves, but they earned their bones there in Palestine. They had success in Galilee, and Yosef took on a Roman name after Vespasian. He called himself also Titus Flavius. But Vespasian went back to Rome, See, the empire was in turmoil. Emperors were dying left and right. They were being overthrown, assassinated. There was the year of the four emperors, and it was time for Vespasian to claim the imperial throne. So he left his son Titus in command there in Palestine. That was when Titus put Jerusalem under siege. The siege was terrible, as many sieges are, and eventually the forces of Titus burned much of the city to the ground, and all of that culminated in the destruction of the Second Temple. This is a seminal moment in the history of the Jewish people. Josephus wrote about this at length. He saw the destruction of the Second Temple as a symbol, an omen, perhaps, that the era of Judaism was on the wane, and the era of the Romans was on the rise. 
many of his contemporaries saw this as a betrayal. And Josephus hasn't necessarily lost that image even today. Many people still call him the Benedict Arnold of Judaism. However, if you look at it from a certain point of view, he may have been right. It might be an unpleasant truth, but the era of Judaism, at the height of Judaism, the Second Temple era, was now over. After the destruction of the Second Temple and the end of the First Romano-Jewish War, the people of Jerusalem were scattered. The people of Judea scattered. The people of all Israel were scattered. This is the second major Jewish diaspora. It's called the Roman Exile. Thousands were killed in the war, and after the war thousands of others were sold into slavery, and many others fled, some to Egypt and some fled east into Persia. Some went further into India and China. And then, many of them wound up far to the northeast. Now there is some controversy as to whether or not this was an official relocation instigated by the emperor, but it probably was, at least at first. Those Jews that were relocated wound up in a land they called Sepharad. Today, in modern Hebrew, they actually still call that nation Sepharad. The Romans, though, called that land by another name. Hispania. That diaspora is the basis for one of the major ethnic distinctions in Judaism. Those Roman exiles eventually became Sephardi Jews, due to the name of the land in which they lived. They were distinct in that they came to Europe in the first century CE, as opposed to the Ashkenazi Jews. They came to Europe in the later Middle Ages. Those Sephardi Jews in Roman Hispania are central to today's story. This is episode 72, Jewish Pirates of the West Indies, part 1. The Sephardi Jews had a number of restrictions placed upon them under Roman rule. Most notably, they were not allowed to own land. So their communities turned to trade to survive. Within a few generations of their relocation, their towns and cities had become hubs of trade in the Roman Empire, they facilitated trade between Africa to the south and Gaul and Britannia to the north. They had been victims, and in this society were still second-class citizens, but the Sephardi made themselves indispensable, and they managed to prosper even under strict regulations. This became a trend in later Sephardi communities, and it would turn out to be a helpful one. When the Western Roman Empire declined, and Roman legions pulled back from Britannia and Gaul, Hispania was, well, they were kept under Roman rule for a time, but eventually the Roman legions pulled back from there as well. But Hispania had that large and thriving community of Jews that managed to hold things together better than in many other parts of the former empire. Then, Hispania was invaded by the Germans, the Visigoths, the Suebi, the Vandals, the Alans, and under them things got worse for the Sephardi Jews. Historian Chris Wickham writes in his book, The Inheritance of Rome, quote, The main lawgivers of the period were fiercely hostile to the main non-Catholic group in Spain, the Jews. They picked up Sisebut's laws and greatly extended them, banning all Jewish religious practices, restricting Jewish civil rights, and, in 694, reducing all Jews to slavery. Visigothic laws have no real equivalent in their violence, and violence of expression, against Jews until the late Middle Ages. End quote. The period of Visigothic rule in former Hispania was terrible for the Sephardi Jews. They were ordered to convert by force if necessary. Any Jews that were caught practicing their religion were exiled or executed. Their children were given to monasteries to be raised by the Catholic Church. However, Chris Wickham does suggest, and He's a professor of medieval history at Oxford, so I'm going to put all of this on him. He tells us that there is some question about how much of that anti-Jewish legislation was what he calls, quote, shadow play. That is to say, a tool of court politics that may not have been, in execution, as bad as the legislation itself seemed to be. See, the Visigoths were recent converts to Catholicism themselves. They had been Aryan Christians just a few years ago. Their anti-Jewish legislation may have been something of a front 
to placate their Frankish Catholic allies and rivals to the east. Now, let's not minimize the suffering of the Sephardi Jews, and I want to be clear, the author doesn't do that either. Jews were persecuted and executed. That happened to human beings, and it was terrible. But it may have been a sort of particularly gruesome theater perpetrated by that Visigothic ruling class in Toledo for the benefit of Frankish visitors. But however bad life was for the Jews in the Visigothic kingdom, things were about to get a lot better, thanks to the arrival of Muslim conquerors. By all accounts, by Sephardic accounts as well as Visigothic and Moorish, the Iberian Jews, many of them, were more than happy to help the Moors in their fight against the Visigothic Catholics. And I'm not just talking about, you know, acting as guides or informants for them. I'm talking about, let's rise up, kill every Goth in town, and hand the Moorish forces a victory. Jews flocked in numbers to Moorish banners, and once their combined forces captured the city at Cordoba, the Moors left the defense of the city in the hands of Sephardi Jews while they went on to conquer elsewhere. The period that followed what is usually considered the final victory of the Moorish invaders in 711 CE is the period after that is considered a Jewish golden age. The Jews in Sepharad benefited from Muslim toleration and their Byzantine knowledge that was flowering in the Islamic golden age, and the Moors benefited from the knowledge of a local population that had held Hispania together for 700 years. The Jewish population of Sepharad or Hispania grew. They had been substantial before the arrival of the Muslims, but the continuity of culture between Iberia and the Middle East seems to have facilitated the immigration of thousands of Jewish families. The Sephardi Jews still lived under certain restrictions in Moorish Spain, restrictions that were almost uniform throughout the Muslim world. They couldn't participate in politics, and while they could now own land, it was still limited. They could marry Muslims, but they would have to convert and raise their children under Islam, and they were subject to the new Islamic laws. But by and large, it was better than Visigothic rule. The Sephardi population flourished once again. They learned of Islamic and Byzantine methods of science and medicine and math. It was a cultural melting pot in which toleration benefited all parties involved and became at least one of the most advanced places in Europe. Now, we're brushing by about 1,500 years of history at light speed. Reality is always more complex than a few sentences can even begin to approach, but let me try. Under Roman rule, the Sephardi Jews in Hispania had it okay, but not great. Under Visigothic rule, things got pretty terrible, and under Moorish rule, things got a little better. Now, that period of Moorish rule in Iberia lasted for several hundred years. However, as always happens, things were, once again, about to change. From the time of the Muslim conquest of Iberia until Ferdinand and Isabella completed the Reconquista in 1492, that's 800 years of history. Islamic Spain expanded and contracted. Catholic northern Spain divided and unified and divided again. All through these centuries of turmoil, the Jewish population of Iberia survived. Often, whenever a new caliphate would take over in the Moorish section of Iberia, or when a new pope would enter office back in Rome, the Iberian Sephardi Jews went through a period of difficulty. Property rights were taken away or limited, children were kidnapped and indoctrinated in Catholic schools, men were killed, and women, well, what happened to them could be worse. Once in the 13th century, the pope and the king of Castile announced a crusade, a holy war, against Islamic Iberia. Their intention was to liberate the rest of what the king of Castile considered his land from the Moors. Crusader knights rode from Italy and Germany and France to aid their Catholic brothers to the king's capital in the city of Toledo. Now, that holy war was financed not by the crown and not by the pope. It was financed by the Jewish population of Toledo. They wanted their king to reclaim all of Castile so that they could reunite with their families and return to their homes. This is one of those situations where the real story is a lot more complex than the extremely simplified version I gave, so let's roll with it. 
When the Crusaders arrived in Toledo, their rallying point for all of their forces, they were eager to get started. The job that they were eager to get started in was killing infidels. Now, there weren't any Muslims in Toledo, but there were plenty of Jews. Those knights from Italy and France and Germany, all of them foreign to Castile, set about in the Jewish quarter of town, raping and pillaging and murdering and burning. There was somewhere around 100,000 Jews in Toledo, and they made good sport for these crusaders. See, back in France and Germany and Italy, Jews were fair game, but not in Castile. Not right then, at least. See, the king had enacted, when he gained his crown, the same sort of anti-Jewish legislation that nearly every Iberian ruler, be they Catholic or Moorish, did when they ascended to their throne. However, like nearly every one of those rulers, the king of Castile had quickly come to realize that it was incredibly stupid to isolate and exterminate hundreds of thousands of literate, educated merchants. They were the glue of Iberia. So, the Castilian knights of Toledo, after they saw what was happening in the Jewish quarter, defended the Jewish citizens of their city from those foreign knights. Things got pretty tense. All of these knights were supposed to be on the same side, and that confused the foreigners. I mean, Jews ate babies and worshipped Satan. Everybody knew that. The Toledo Knights had to explain, at sword point actually, that no, Jews don't eat babies and they don't worship Satan. That almost turned into a battle, into an internal war between two armies of crusaders. Now, I'm not here to make any modern political statements, but if you wanted to search for a bit of historical wisdom around the situation in modern-day Israel, medieval Iberia might not be the worst place to look. The tensions between the Catholics, Jews, and Moorish Iberians was, well, there are similarities to be found. But it's telling that the Catholic Knights of Castile stood up against other Catholics for their Jewish brothers. See, in Castile at the time, well, when you have an external threat, like the Moorish kingdom to the south, a society tends to band together and the differences between people tend to dissipate. And that had happened in Castile, and that benefited the Sephardi Jews greatly. In his book, Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, Edward Kritzler writes, quote, In Spain's feudal society, Jews were an educated elite, a merchant class also respected as physicians and financiers. The 500,000 Jews of Sepharad represented the oldest and largest Jewish community outside of Palestine. Their leaders boasted lineage to King David and considered themselves the aristocracy of Jewry. These were halcyon days for a people unwelcome in most of Europe. End quote. Now, I'm not sure I agree with all of that. Mr. Kurtzler's definition of halcyon days might differ from mine. They were still second-class citizens. However, it's important to note that in Catholic and Islamic Spain, the Jews were citizens. See, feudal Europe was built around a tiny aristocracy that was allied with the clergy, the first and second estates. They told the vast, unwashed masses, the third estate, that Jesus actually wanted their life to be nasty, brutish, and short. But it was helpful to have a medium-sized, educated elite, middle class. I mean, barons and dukes weren't filthy in their hands with trade, they were busy exploiting the serfs on their massive tracts of land. That left all commerce and most trade in many parts of Europe, but especially in what would become Spain, to the Jews. They proved to be helpful allies. But when the situation called for it, they were also helpful targets. See, those vast numbers of serfs were never particularly happy with their lot, Nasty, brutish, and short lives are not pleasant. But they were fed a decent dose of Jesus and beer and food, and that usually kept them quiet. However, if the beer and food dried up, say their country had a bad winter and the crops weren't all that good, the serfs began agitating. These were always tense moments for the aristocracy. Those unhappy peasants were likely to come knocking onto their doors with torches and pitchforks with murder on their mind. So, 
the aristocracy and their clerical allies, the first and second estates, would divert the blame. It wasn't us, you guys. We're all in this together. We're all good Catholics. It was the Jews. That's the ticket. They, I don't know, made the winter extra cold. See, they're all able to read, and book learning is evil. That's how they knew how to make the winter so cold. Now, I might be making light of general attitudes here, but what followed these sorts of stories was never funny. See, those arguments... Well, they usually worked. In Seville, at the end of the 14th century, a friar named Ferrant Martinez gave an impassioned sermon. The people of Seville were suffering. They had just gone through bouts of black plague. There were reports of cities going entirely mad, of men killing each other, and women, even nuns, stripping nude and fornicating there in the street and Friar Martinez knew just who was to blame for all of this evil. We know that the Black Plague was the fault of fleas and rats and a generally unsanitary way of life, but Seville's Jews generally bathed once in a while, and they had organizations in their community that kept their streets in better order. They kept them clean, so they usually suffered slightly less from the plague. Now, they weren't immune from it, obviously. They got hit by the plague as well, but a general sense of cleanliness helps. Martinez, though, shouted down from his pulpit that the Jewish community fared better because they were in league with Satan. That reported madness, the men killing each other and women fornicating in the streets, well, that was, we know today, probably the result of ergot poisoning, what they call St. Anthony's Fire, But Friar Martinez just knew that this St. Anthony's fire was actually the result of Seville's Jews killing babies, drinking their blood, and throwing their bodies in the water supply. And he told everyone that would listen. And when people were suffering, they were willing to listen. Contemporary rabbinical texts call what followed Friar Martinez's sermon the Pogrom of 5151, according to the Hebrew calendar. Modern-day historians call it the Massacre of 1391. I may do a special episode about this event. I'm not sure yet. At the least, I will put up a link on the website to a fantastic secondary source about the Massacre of 1391. It sparked off two major exoduses from Iberia, and those will play into our greater story. And, as a storytelling device... The massacre of 1391 illustrates just why Spanish Jews may have been so willing to ally with foreign pirates against Spain. But even on this show, on which we regularly talk about the atrocities of the pirates, this was worse. On the very day that Friar Martinez gave his sermon, 4,000 people were killed. Men, women, and children without mercy and without pity. Their homes and their places of worship were destroyed in an afternoon. The massacre swept through the city in the following days, and then out into the countryside, and then all throughout Castile. In the end, every synagogue in the city was destroyed. If it weren't destroyed, it was appropriated by the Catholic Church. All land that had once been owned by Jewish families was appropriated by the Church as well. Homes, shops, farms everything. This was not outside of the norm of Castilian politics. There was a saying in the kingdom at the time that the Iberian Jews were the money box of the kingdom. Any time that crown funds were starting to run a little bit low and the population had been taxed to their limit, the king could kick up some trouble, send out a friar to give a fiery sermon, and then they could appropriate a bunch of Jewish property. However, this massacre of 1391 was different. When it was over, 100,000 Jews had been killed in the massacre. That's roughly a third of the Kingdom of Castile's Jewish population. That's a fifth of all the Jews in Iberia. That's 10% of every Jew in Europe. And they were killed. Another 100,000 had been converted Some of them legitimately converted, but most of them not really. But when you're faced with torches and pitchforks and the very real threat of death, not just for you, but for your family, 
well, that's worth a mass. At least for some people. The other 300,000 Jews in Iberia went underground. They went into hiding. For a year, mobs ravaged the Catholic kingdoms, and they killed or forcefully converted every Jew they found. When that year was up, things started to quiet down, and Jews were once again allowed back out into the open. But they weren't allowed at this point to practice their faith in public, nor were they allowed to own property or participate in politics, really anything. All of the rights that had been granted them as citizens, even second-class citizens, had been disbanded. By 1392, after 800 years, the restrictions of Visigothic Spain had returned. Those that converted to Catholicism were called conversos, or new Christians. They were allowed to do all of those things that were prohibited from the Jews, they were allowed to trade and buy property. They were even allowed into government because now they were good Catholics by all accounts. So they took roles in government and the military, and even some of them rose into the nobility. Now, the Sephardi Jews had always been a part of Iberian culture, at least since the first century CE. But now that they were practicing Catholics, they were allowed all of the rights of full citizenship. But no one ever forgot that they were Jewish, or at least descended from Jews. See, Judaism is a religion, and they had left that religion behind. But Judaism is also a cultural identity, a racial identity. Then, after a few more decades of this tense peace between the Catholics and the Jews of Spain, Queen Isabella called an inquisition. It was to be headed by her confessor, Tomás de Torquemada, and thus begun what has since been called the Holy Terror. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella's armies were wrapping up the Reconquista. They were expelling all of the Moors from Iberia, and Isabella wanted to ensure that the new kingdom would be free from heretics of any kind. Now, she couldn't devote her forces to it, but she could call in the church. So Jews all throughout the combined Spanish kingdom were shaken down, their property was appropriated once again, and they were sent to live in ghettos. The conversos, those new Christians, protested this, but that only served to turn the eyes of the Inquisition on them. Most of the Jews in Iberia fled. Thousands and thousands fled west to Portugal. There they were able to start new lives. They were able, many of them, to call themselves conversos, but they actually continued to practice their own faith. They had to do so in secret, but they did. They spent their lives doing their best to avoid notice. Again, Edward Kritzler writes, quote, History would come to call these secret Jews Meranos, meaning pigs. Though this term has generally lost its pejorative meaning, I prefer to call them what they called themselves in the sanctity of their own homes, Jews. End quote. Now today, historians have abandoned the term Meranos, Today, this class of Jews, mostly in Portugal, that were hiding in plain sight, are called crypto-Jews. For several years this continued. The Inquisition swept through the kingdoms of Castile, Leon, and Aragon, and did their best to eradicate any Jews they found, or force them into conversion. And then, on 12 January 1492, four people met in a room in Seville. Two were the king and queen of Aragon and Castile, Ferdinand and Isabella. The third was their treasurer, Louis de Saint-Angel, and the fourth was Christopher Columbus. They were discussing Columbus's plans to sail west and find Asia. Now, Ferdinand and Isabella initially turned him down, but that treasurer, the third person in the room, Louis, would intercede on his behalf he would actually convince the queen to grant Columbus his voyage. The story, mostly told from Columbus's point of view, is a passionate one. Columbus was riding out of town. He was, by that point, outside of the capital, and he had informed the king and queen and treasurer that he was going to try his luck in France and Britain. But he was caught up on the road by the treasurer, who pleaded with him not to leave. See, here's the thing. That treasurer was a converso. He was a former Jew 
that now took up Catholicism. He attended Mass, he took the sacrament, and by everyone's accounts, he was a good Catholic. However, two of his cousins had recently been burned to death at the hands of the Inquisition. His family was being closely investigated. They were looking into any crypto jewelry that might be taking place. And without the intercession of Isabella, he most likely would have already been burned to death as well. Now, we don't know if this treasurer held to Judaic religious practices in secret, but even if he didn't, members of his family did. And he was now privy to the royal plans that had yet to be announced to expel every Jew from Spain. So Columbus writes of him pleading, with tears in his eyes, not to leave Spain, not to go to France and England. For some reason, this converso needed Columbus to sail from Spain to find new lands across the ocean. And it worked. Columbus stayed. He didn't go to France and England. And eventually, due to the argument of this treasurer, he got his voyage. And then... Well, nobody knows exactly what happened next. Columbus argued for a hereditary lordship in any lands that he might find. Initially, the king and queen just dismissed that idea entirely. However, over the next few days, Isabella seems to have changed her mind. Many scholars seem to believe that that may have been due to the advice of the treasurer. He said that it was a good idea to give Christopher Columbus hereditary lordship in some of the lands he would find. And then the friends and family of Louis de saint agreed to finance the voyage of Columbus. He had the backing of the crown and some financial investment, but mostly the investors were Jews or crypto-Jews or conversos. They were given a stake in the profits of the Colombian voyage, and they were also given the right to claim lands of their own under Columbus's dominion, under his hereditary lordship. Then those families who financed the voyage chose a few dozen young men, all of them either Jewish or crypto-Jews, and all of them the sons of relatively prominent families in Spain and Portugal, and they demanded that Christopher Columbus take them along. On the very day that Columbus set sail, Ferdinand and Isabella announced that all Jews in their combined kingdom had four months in which to leave their homes. They declared that the Reconquista was complete and they vowed to expel all the Jews and all Merano heretics. And here we see what's called the Sephardic Diaspora, the population of European Jews that dated back to the first century CE were expelled from Hispania. They were thrown into the wind to land wherever they could, and they landed all over the world. Some fled over the border into France, but it wasn't much better in France. A large number of them fled to Germany and the Netherlands, and in the coming decades would actually find some allies in the Lutheran Reformation, and many of them, even potentially most of the Sephardi exiles, settled to the south on the northern coast of Africa. Now, that was really close to Spain, so it was easy to get to, and it was still under Moorish rule, and many of these Sephardi Jews had some connections in the world of the Moors. Now, we'll be talking about those North African Jews quite a bit when we talk about the Barbary Corsairs. Perhaps none of them more than Barbarossa's second-in-command, Siana Rais, or Sinan, the Jew. But the Sephardi exiles that concern us today are those that fled into the New World. The very first of those were among the very first Europeans to arrive in the Americas, of course, barring earlier Viking explorers and things like that. But they sailed with Columbus when he sailed the ocean blue in 1492, when he found land and the Spanish Empire was born, Those young Jews whose families were to thank for the whole operation were there. On his fourth voyage, Columbus traveled down to the Mosquito Coast. Then he traveled on to Panama and Darien. And then he sailed north. He was trying to get to Santo Domingo, but he was thrown off course by a storm. He made a quick stop on Cuba, but he landed on the north coast of Jamaica. Now... 
there was drama with the governor of Santo Domingo. What we call today Hispaniola or Haiti in the Dominican Republic, the governor there, he didn't like Columbus. He, in fact, wanted to see Christopher Columbus killed. However, when Christopher Columbus got word to him that he and his men had been stranded on the north coast of Jamaica, that governor agreed to send out a rescue mission to save Columbus and his men. However, that rescue never arrived. So, most of Columbus's crew, well, while well, spending a few days on a Jamaican beach sounds pretty nice, when you're stuck there and out of booze, things can get tense. So they mutinied. They stole canoes from Columbus that had been acquired from the Panamanian natives, and they tried to row over to Santo Domingo. They failed to do so, and this proved to be a singularly brutal event. They had Native Americans with them to row the boats and worked them nearly to death. They whipped them until they were bloody, and when finally they realized that their boats were too heavy, they threw the Native Americans overboard. When those natives clung to the canoes to try and, you know, not drown to death, the mutineers chopped their hands off with hatchets. Eventually, realizing they wouldn't be able to make it to Santo Domingo, they returned to Jamaica and set up a camp elsewhere on the beach. Now, Columbus had only himself, his brother, Bartolomeo, and his teenage son, Fernando, and then that few dozen other Jewish teenagers that were loyal to him. I wonder if they would have stayed loyal to him, they were stranded on a beach half a world away from their home, had the survival of their entire people not been in question here. Remember, the financiers of Columbus's voyages had the right to claim land, but only in the lands under Christopher Columbus and his hereditary lordship. Those teenagers who were led by Columbus's son, all of them teenagers, attacked the mutineers on the beach. Now, these were hardened sailors. They were brutal men. They had just chopped the hands off of human beings trying not to drown to death. The teenagers were boys, and, according to Columbus's writings, were, quote, brought up in a softer mode of life, end quote. They were the sons of prosperity, of financiers and merchants and physicians. These sailors were hard-bitten men, and the mutineers expected an easy victory. But they received, well, not that. This brigade of teenagers rushed their camp and cut down any man that raised a sword to them. In minutes, Ferdinando, Columbus's son, had his sword at the heart of the mutineer captain, and they all surrendered. And that was the beginning of the settlement of Jamaica, over the next seven years of Christopher Columbus's life, two cities were established on the island. The first was built on the north coast of the island, close to where Columbus had originally landed. The second was built deep inland, to the south, away from the main city. It was close to a, an easily defensible port. Much later, they would call that town Spanish Town. However, the inhabitants of that little settlement may have had another secret name, maybe something like Nueva Sephirat. That town was scouted and established by those teenage boys that had helped secure Christopher Columbus's command. The families of those boys, some of the most prominent Jews in Spain, sailed for Jamaica. They settled at that inland city. They put down roots there. They started having children. Now, there is an easy trap to fall into here. The Sephardi Jews were a persecuted people, and we tend to give them sympathy. They endured terrible things in Europe. They deserve that sympathy. There were pogroms and ethnic cleansing and the horror of the Spanish Inquisition. However, we can't ignore the realities of those people that did arrive on Jamaica with the Columbus family. Christopher Columbus may have thanked those teenagers for helping secure his rule. However, everybody else who lived on the island already didn't. Christopher Columbus was accused of the worst sort of brutality and tyranny, and he was guilty of most of it, at least, according to both his enemies and his allies. 
torturing Native Americans, enslaving them, working them near to death, oftentimes to death, and cutting off ears and hands when things didn't go his way. Imagine all the terrors of the Belgian Congo. Most of them happened on Jamaica under Christopher Columbus. Now, the Jewish community on Jamaica was largely separate from the Colombian community, but their hands are not clean in everything that happened in early Jamaica either. They employed and enjoyed the fruits of the Native American slaves as much as anyone on the island. They owned slaves, they colonized Indian lands, and they extracted wealth from those lands. Now, that's not outside the norm for Europeans in the New World. Everyone, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the English, the French, the Dutch, anyone who had a colony in the New World did at least similar things. The Jewish minority on Jamaica wasn't different in that, aside from their religion. Now, those teenage boys that aided Columbus and established their own community, as would really most teenage boys in their situation, kept harems of Native American concubines. These were rich young men who found themselves suddenly in a position of power far away from their families with hundreds of potential concubines. Every settler on Jamaica, be they Catholic, be they Italian, be they Spanish, or be they Jewish, well, they had at least 200 slaves allotted to them from the local population, and those boys were able to choose the most beautiful in those 200 to serve their needs. Now, those boys weren't the only ones doing it. Every man who had the opportunity did so. Most of the initial settlers of Jamaica didn't bring their families with them, so they did as they pleased. Now, the descendants of those boys and their families that came to Jamaica played a role, as key a role, in the enslavement of the Native American population of Jamaica and, later, of African slaves as anyone in the New World. And if Christopher Columbus was terrible, and he was, we need to realize that the Jewish population of Jamaica were his allies. Now, they were his allies because each relied on one another for mutual survival, Without the support of the Jewish population of Spain, Columbus may have never discovered the New World, and without Christopher Columbus, the Jews of Sepharad may not have had a way across the ocean to escape the persecution that they were living under. So, keeping the hereditary lineage of Columbus in power was essential to the survival of the Jews of Jamaica. See, the Columbus family was separate from the crown of what was becoming Spain. They kept the Spanish Inquisition out of Jamaica. But the Spanish Inquisition was everywhere else in the New World within a generation. Lima had a huge Jewish population. They traded in silver from the Inca mines there. But they had to live with inquisitors. They were forced to live in hiding, as conversos. The Jews in Havana and Panama and Cartagena lived similar lives. It was A little bit better than you might have experienced back in Europe, but it wasn't great. But the Jews on Jamaica, well, they were safe. They could practice openly their religion for the first time in, well, maybe in any of their lives. Those teenagers that lived on Jamaica, there may be things to say about their activities that we would dislike, but we have to remember that this is the first time for any of them that they had not lived under the boot of oppression. Now, there was a sentiment among them and many of their family members that later came to Jamaica that Christopher Columbus was the Moses of the West Indies. He had brought their people out of a terrible fate and led them into a land of prosperity. Now, Columbus himself was aware of those comparisons and even encouraged them, but he died only seven years after crash landing on Jamaica. But he did have that deal with the crown, So his son took up the post as Admiral of the Indies. Eventually, he was raised to Governor of the Indies and finally Viceroy of the Indies. That's a powerful position, and he used that position to help protect the people who had financed his father's operation. He gave the governorship of Jamaica to the head of the most prominent of the Sephardi families on Jamaica. Now, he governed well. He had protectionist policies, as you might imagine. For example, in 1514, a man named Peter Martyr, who was the royal chronicler of the Indies, visited Jamaica. He noted, quote, There are two settlements, 
but only one will have my church. End quote. There were other reports, but this one, it didn't say that there was a community of Jews, but there was a community that was unwilling to have his church, the Catholic Church. Well, that would have concerned King Ferdinand back in Aragon. However, he didn't do anything about it. See, the Queen of Castile, Queen Isabella, his wife, had died. Now, if blame were to be laid for that most recent pogrom across their joint kingdom, the one begun in 1478, declared officially in 1492, the one that had dispersed Jews all over the world, if blame were to be laid for that, well, it should probably be laid mostly at the feet of Queen Isabella. She was... Well, she was behind much of the policy of the Catholic monarchs, and it shouldn't... Well, actually, let me change my words there. To say she was behind their policy has almost criminal connotations, and much of what she accomplished does deserve those connotations, but far from all of it. She initiated and supported and championed nearly all of Castile and Leon's most sweeping reforms, reforms that would give birth to Spain. There were positive changes in church policy. There were sweeping reforms in criminal justice. They were far from what we would call justice today, but they were a step out of the medieval system that had been in place for centuries. And then there were economic reforms, reforms that would set up Spain to be the most powerful empire in the world for more than a century. But she was behind the expulsion of all non-Catholics, the seizure of their property, and... Most of the tortured and executed Jews could, at some level, be laid at her feet. But King Ferdinand, her husband, did not seem to share her zeal for persecution. Perhaps he did share the zeal, but his policies, his actions, don't really reflect that. Now, he may have shared all her prejudices, in fact, he probably did, but he didn't see them as a priority. He probably knew on some level that Jamaica housed many, hundreds, even thousands, of Iberia's Sephardi Jews who had fled his country. But he knew of communities of Jews in his other possessions as well, but he didn't do anything about any of them. Now, his empire, his burgeoning empire, was busy digesting the Western Hemisphere. But in Jamaica, even if he had cared to deal with them, He didn't actually have the legal right to do anything about the Jewish settlement there. Isabella had granted Christopher Columbus hereditary rights on Jamaica, and those rights lasted through the family of Christopher Columbus almost a hundred years. But when his line ended, so did his family's hereditary claim. Christopher Columbus's grandson died without issue. Now, in Many noble families, at least in many royal families, they would find somebody, a cousin maybe, who was close enough to take over the title. But that isn't exactly how it works in all nobility. And when the crown wants to do away with your hereditary line and take command over the lands that you controlled, well, the house of Christopher Columbus was disbanded. Spain finally had the legal justification to take possession of Jamaica, and they did so. When we think about a gold rush, those of us, here in the U.S. at least, most of us tend to think about the gold rush of 1849. Gold was found out west, and suddenly thousands of prospectors undertook the journey through sweeping plains and dangerous Native American territory, across the Rocky Mountains, and into an endless desert. That was the birth of the Old West. Now, the West was in reality a bit less wild than some in pop culture might make it out to be, but gunfights and cattle rustling and armed gangs battling U.S. Marshals were a reality of the time. Really, it's not that dissimilar from the Golden Age of Piracy. You have newly claimed territories filled with settlers and lawless men and women looking to strike it rich, robbing people, clashing with authorities, and clashing with the Spanish, and you have dens of sin that served up drink and women and gambling to anyone that could pay. Now, we would need to switch out the rum for whiskey and the ships for horses, but, you know, they both had cool boots and fantastic hats, so basically the same thing. However, those 49ers in 1849 were small-timers when it came to gold rushes. 
possibly the greatest gold rush the world has ever known was that of the first decades of the 16th century. It would be almost impossible to overstate the desire for gold that gripped the hearts of the Spanish people when reports started coming back from what they thought was India, and not the desire for wealth, exactly, at least not just that. There were other roads by which someone could get wealthy, pearls or land or increasingly through sugar or salt. I mean, salt was one of the greatest commodities in the world at the time. It was worth a comparable amount to gold by weight, and there were amazing salt mines in the Americas. But salt just isn't the same. I once bought some gold coins. It's a decent investment, apparently, when times seem particularly troubled. Plus, I do a show about pirates. I thought that I should know what it feels like to hold a physical gold coin in my hand. And it felt, well, there's something almost mystical about gold. It's hard to explain. I had this moment of dragon sickness, maybe, that sudden lust to hoard as much of the stuff as possible. No, I only had one tiny coin, one-tenth of an ounce, but I immediately started thinking about how to budget gold into my monthly expenses and planning when would be the best time to buy, strategically speaking. But then I stopped myself, and I thought, oh, that's what it feels like. But if someone told me today that it turns out Mars is made entirely of solid gold, I would immediately try to stow away on a rocket and make my way up to space. So when Columbus returned from his first voyage and word began to spread that India was a land where there were literal mountains of gold, where the rivers flowed with raw gold nuggets, there was this sudden and immediate feeling. Nearly every man in Spain wanted a piece of it. This put a very real lust for gold in the hearts of many Spaniards, and there was a lust for more than that. There was the call to adventure, to travel and exploration. There was the desire not just for gold as a material, but to get rich. And then there was a very real desire to bring the word of God to heathen peoples. Anyone who had that will for adventure and who had the funds to buy their way on board, signed up for a voyage to the New World. This is what gave us the conquistadors. And then there was a lust for, well, just lust, really. Edward Kritzler puts it perfectly in Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, quote, A golden thread had wound its way into the fabric of every Spaniard's imagination, it wove an exotic pattern of desire, stirring a man's dreams. Wherever men gathered, the talk was the same. Tales of opulent cities with riches beyond belief and beautiful naked maidens aching to please. End quote. But there was one group in Spain that was somewhat immune from that dragon sickness, from that lust for American gold. That group was too busy dealing with the fallout from the recent proclamation that they were no longer welcome in their homes. That was the Sephardi Jews. Now, I don't want to misrepresent them here. There were plenty of young Jewish men and converted Jews that signed up to be conquistadors. They wanted to go in search of lands to conquer and those mountains of gold. According to Juan Gill from the University of Seville in his work The Conversos and the Inquisition of Seville, there were more than 100 conversos, or crypto-Jews perhaps, with the expedition of Hernan Cortes alone. It has been suggested that nearly every expedition of conquistadors had at least a few Jews among them. They had centuries of experience working with Islamic navigators and mapmakers, and well, the Iberian Jews had tools and knowledge that the Catholic Spanish still really didn't. However, the fervor that gripped the hearts of most of Spain to acquire gold passed by the majority of the Jewish and crypto-Jewish population of Iberia. At the time, they had bigger things to worry about. This is episode 73, Threads of Gold. Today's show was going to be Jewish Pirates of the West Indies Part 2, but as it turned out, there weren't very many pirates, and much of today's story takes place far from the West Indies. 
However, it does still circle around the story of the Iberian Sephardi Jews that were now on Jamaica. If you missed last week's episode and are wondering what conversos and crypto Jews are, you really should just go listen to last week's show. But if you want a quick refresher, here goes. In 1478, Queen Isabella called for an inquisition to deal with Jewish heretics in her land. That inquisition put thousands of Jews under questioning and torture. They gave those Jews three options. First, you could convert to Catholicism. Do so and your family would be granted the full rights and privileges of Spanish citizenship. Hundreds of thousands of Jews did convert, and those they were called conversos. Now, many of those conversos entered government or the military or even rose into the ranks of the nobility. Some of them were quite high in the Spanish court. But the second option given to the Jewish population was to leave Spain. Hundreds of thousands of Jews chose that route. They went mostly to either Italy, North Africa, or Portugal, and most of them went to Portugal. It was connected by land, it was very nearby, and it was familiar. It was also relatively tolerant and did not yet belong to Spain. They had a third option. They could stay there in Spain, but they would be a lower class, virtually without rights. Now, many did choose that option. They didn't want to leave their homes. Perhaps they thought that this trouble, this inquisition, would pass them by. They had survived many other such troubles, but this inquisition didn't pass. It got worse. In 1492, on the same day that Christopher Columbus set sail, the Catholic monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella declared that all Jews in their combined kingdom had four months to make a choice. They could convert, leave the kingdom, or be disposed of. Many chose conversion, but most of them didn't really convert. You can't make somebody legitimately change their beliefs by threat of death, Really, it's hard to say even how many of those earlier conversos in 1478 actually converted. It was sort of an open secret that many of them didn't really believe. And the Spanish called the false converts, well, they called them pigs, meranos. Now, we call them today crypto-Jews, a Jewish population in Spain hiding their true faith. If they were questioned, they would claim to be conversos, and they would usually add that they were Portuguese. Now, many of them by this point actually were Portuguese, but it was a clever way to keep themselves out of the hands of the Inquisition. By about 1515, Portugal housed around 250,000 Jews. That's nearly the entire Jewish population of Iberia. They called themselves Portuguese conversos. They still pretended to be Catholic. In the meanwhile, though, thousands of Jews were arriving in the New World. There were the aforementioned Jewish conquistadors, but after a few more years, families began arriving as settlers in the new New World cities. They arrived in huge numbers. Occasionally, entire ships full of Iberian Sephardi Jews would arrive in Havana or Cartagena or Lima. Mostly, they arrived in Lima, In the New World, they had the opportunity to start over, to start new lives. There was ample land and plenty of opportunity, and arriving in Lima on the west coast of South America put thousands of miles of ocean between them and the Inquisitors. The governor of Lima would occasionally write back to Seville and inform the court of the arrival of yet another ship full of Portuguese conversos and everybody knew what he was talking about. However, those ships were typically owned by a powerful converso back in Spain, somebody with the influence to protect those who had just arrived. Now, someone on board those ships had to have a license to settle in Lima. That was how you were allowed to settle in the New World. Often that license would be procured by that same powerful converso. But every family needed a license to settle in the New World, and a ship full of refugees with only one license on board, usually presented a problem. However, they had a loophole. They could bring along as many servants as they liked. 
If they had only one license on board, usually the oldest man would say, here is my license, here is my wife, here are my children, and here are my 350 servants. Psst, they weren't actually servants. Now everybody knew what was going on here. The Inquisition, had they been there, would certainly have stopped them, but they weren't there. Now, imagine that you're the governor of a large-ish new settlement dealing in literal tons of Inca gold. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of tons of solid gold. That gold needs to be weighed and smelted and minted and counted and then shipped all the way home. Who would you trust to do that job? The Inca slaves, who you had just stolen all the gold from? The conquistadors, who were the sons of nobility that didn't usually have the skills to do that. No, you want merchants and bankers. Would you, in that situation, turn away a ship full of educated, literate merchants and bankers? Oh, and there's another thing here. Those settlers in the New World, those Europeans, were dying in droves. That happened any time a new population of Europeans arrived. New diseases killed sometimes as many as half of the first settlers within just a few weeks of arrival. And that ship of Jewish refugees, whichever one we're talking about, just so happened to have several physicians on board. Were you a governor, you would most likely not turn away that ship. Now, I realize that there are a number of cliché stereotypes about the Jewish people packed in there. However, the fact that these ships were full of merchants, bankers, doctors, and their wives, well, all of that comes from respected, accredited, published historians, several of them themselves Jewish, and what's more, those stereotypes are born out of the fact that these Sephardi Jews were able to read. They could write, this was before Lima had a printing press, and not only could they write in Hebrew, but they knew Spanish and usually Latin and sometimes Greek. They also had a much better grasp of arithmetic than really anybody except for the nobility. And outside of perhaps Istanbul and probably China, these Sephardi Jewish doctors were some of the best in the world. So the Jews that arrived in South and Central America were tolerated, but even though they were necessary, they were never really accepted. They might not face the Inquisition in these colonies, but most governors insisted that they keep up the polite falsehood that they were Portuguese conversos. That was true for every Spanish colony in the New World except for one. Nominally, Jamaica was still under the control of the Columbus family during the early 16th century, but in reality it was in the hands of about 20 Jewish families that all lived there. The governor was a converso in the eyes of Spain, but on the island they were able to practice Judaism openly. Mostly they were able to practice Judaism because there weren't any Catholics on the island. See, Jamaica according to Christopher Columbus, was supposed to be a land so rich in gold that it eclipsed the sun. The only problem with that is that it wasn't. There was no gold on Jamaica. There was no silver, just a bunch of land. So all of the Spaniards, all of the Catholic Spaniards, well, in those early years of Spanish colonization, their eyes were filled with rivers of gold, with mountains of gold, and with aching maidens, so they left. Mostly they went to the main, where there were actual gold mines. The Sephardi families were, well, they were the only Europeans left on Jamaica. Within only about 19 years since the founding of the colony, well, it seemed like Jamaica was doomed to fail. But the thing is, the Jews really liked it there. There were sandy beaches and palm trees and good soil, and no inquisitors for hundreds of leagues around. So the governor, the patriarch of one of those families, bought everything that would be needed to start a sugar mill from someone in Santo Domingo, and then he sent word back to his king in Europe. He started off in that letter with the bad news. He told the king that, quote, No citizen has prospered, nor kept his health for a day. 
end quote. But then he gave a little bit of a carrot. He described, quote, the south side of the island where the land is plentiful in beef and bread with very good parts suitable for navigation to Santa Marta, Cartagena, and the mainland, end quote. He went on to tell the king about his sugar mill idea and that much of the land of Jamaica was perfectly suited for growing sugar, which, you know, it was, and this was music to the king's ears. In Europe, sugar was at least as good as gold, and not only that, it was a renewable resource. But there weren't enough people on Jamaica to work the land, not yet. So the governor recommended that the king send an additional 30 Portuguese families. That's a strange request. The king he was writing to was the king of quite a lot, but not the king of Portugal. So why would the governor request Portuguese families? Now, you might have already figured this out, but Edward Critzler writes, quote, In Crown correspondence, reference to Portuguese residing in Spanish lands pertained not to national origin, but rather was a code word for the worst heretics in his kingdom. When the communiques specified Portuguese, the king read between the lines, Jamaica for the Jews or the colony goes under. End quote. That's a bold tactic. It was almost extortion. Extremely polite extortion, to be sure, but, well, he was describing just how awful and useless Jamaica was unless the king made use of the governor's sugar mill, and he would only do so if the king sent him enough Jewish families to people Jamaica. Now, the king knew exactly what he was being asked, and he knew very well that Jamaica was now a haven for the Sephardi Jews. Remember that letter we quoted last time? There are only two cities, and only one will have my church. Well, that letter was sent back to the queen, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. But she died, and it was this king that received it. His name was Charles I of Spain, and he was the grandson of Ferdinand and Isabella. Now, that's a powerful lineage, but not his only powerful lineage. From his father's side of the family, he had recently inherited the dukedom of Burgundy and lordship over the Netherlands. They weren't yet the Spanish Netherlands, but he would make them so when his mother died and he became king of Spain. Then he was elected by various electors in many different provinces, Archduke of Austria, King of the Romans, and King of Italy. See, he was busy working his way toward being elected Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. That's when those letters arrived, informing him of the Jewish presence on Jamaica. The letter from the Royal Chronicler of the West Indies and from the Governor of Jamaica. And he was himself an Inquisitor. He was the chief knight of the Holy Inquisition, as it happened. He had no love for Jewish heretics, and he had absolutely no mind to help them establish a colony anywhere in the world. However, he was a busy man, and he didn't have time to bother dealing with a colony of Jews halfway around the world. Not only was he duke, archduke, and king at least twice over, not only was he the chief knight of the Holy Inquisition and a man attempting to become Holy Roman Emperor, well, he had other heretics in one of his kingdoms that were much more pressing. He actually knew Martin Luther personally, and it quickly became evident that Martin Luther's heresy was a real concern. Now, mind you, he got those letters about Jamaica right about the time Luther started becoming a problem. Germany was on fire. There were Lutherans breaking away from the church, there were Anabaptists, there were peasant revolts, the Jews were not his concern. Then, on the eastern border of Austria, to which he was the Archduke, Vlad Dracula's son and the house of Draculisti was overthrown by the Ottoman Turks. They were the last defenders of Christianity in their realm. Now the Turks had Wallachia, much of what would be Hungary, and an army of Mongols on their doorstep. And that army of Ottoman Turks, Wallachians, Hungarians, and Mongols, was riding for Austrian lands. They were going to try for Vienna. Then the King of France, 
And this is well before Louis XIV made a deal with the Ottoman Empire. Francis I was this king's name. Well, he made a deal with the Ottoman Empire, and he started making noises about war with the Spanish Netherlands, much the same way that the Sun King would more than a hundred years later. That is a lot on one ruler's plate. He had holdings all over Europe, and nearly every country in Europe seemed to be giving him serious problems. Luckily, there was one nation in Europe that was a staunch ally. See, Charles's aunt, Catherine of Aragon, had just married the King of England, Henry VIII. She was sure to make Henry VIII a lifelong ally to her nephew Charles and a devout Catholic till the end of his days. So, Charles had troubles. He had Lutheran revolts, he had two wars, and at least two separate rebellions on his plate. Wars and revolts and rebellions are expensive business. Luckily, he had all of those New World colonies constantly sending over treasure ships filled with gold and silver. But even with all of that gold and silver flowing into his coffers, it flowed out just as quickly. The armies of Charles and his many different nations were constantly on the verge of falling apart due to lack of funds, but he always got a ship just in time to ensure that everybody got paid. But if even one of those treasure ships was lost at sea, it would be a great blow. In 1522, Hernán Cortés sent three of those treasure ships from Mexico bound for Spain. The winds pushed them to the south side of Cuba instead of to Havana, which is where they typically would have gone. But that wasn't a huge problem. They could still make their way along the southern coast of Cuba and up through the Windward Passage between Cuba and Santo Domingo. There was an Italian explorer sailing the New World named Giovanni de Verrazzano. Now, he had explored much of what would become French North America because he was working for the King of France. But he had made his way down to the Bahamas, and then into the Windward Passage, at just about the same time that those three Spanish treasure ships arrived. He captured all three of them, just off the coast of Jamaica. Now, Verrazano would likely bristle at any suggestion that he was a pirate. He saw himself, and was, an explorer. He mapped much of the Atlantic coast of North America for the first time of any European, and that seizure of the three treasure ships was an act of war sanctioned by the French king. It was not an act of piracy. However, Charles, the king of Spain, certainly thought that it was a clear case of piracy. He wrote a formal condemnation of the act and sent an ambassador off to the French king. When that messenger returned, he brought word from the French monarch, which read, quote, the sun shines on me just the same as on you, and I would like to see the clause in Adam's will that bars me from my share of the riches of the new world. End quote. This was the loss that Charles had feared. And he was aware that had there been a reasonable presence on Jamaica, a presence of armed merchant vessels and coast guard ships, well, that would have stopped the seizure of his treasure galleons by Verrazano. And Keep in mind, this was an early treasure ship sent by Cortes himself. We're not talking about silver coins. We're talking about chests and chests full of Aztec gold. This was a major blow. He needed a presence on Jamaica, but Jamaica was close to failing. Now, I'm sure Charles would have preferred to send out a ship or two full of good Catholic noblemen and their retinues, a few hundred Catholic soldiers and sailors to guard the island and the waters nearby. But he was still dealing with the Ottomans and the French and the Lutherans, and there was trouble in Bohemia. Actually, there was a combined force in the Mediterranean of Muslim and Jewish corsairs who were really unhappy with recent events in Spain, and, well, they were menacing the entire Mediterranean Sea. We'll be talking about that later. So Charles agreed, since there was no one else, to send out those Portuguese families to Jamaica. He even sent them off with supplies, and 
fairly good supplies, enough to keep them alive for at least a year, as well as everything needed to get a sugar plantation up and running, and then the materials needed to build a fortress and start a small coast guard. He may have been a Catholic and an Inquisitor, but he was also, well, perhaps not the most powerful person in the world. There was the Ottoman Sultan, and the Pope, arguably, but he was at least in the top three. Well, he had very real-world concerns on his plate. He was not an ideologue. He was a pragmatic ruler. So he decided to utilize the Portuguese conversos rather than persecute them. He gave the Jews Jamaica, in essence. He put nothing in writing, nothing was made official, but as long as they didn't cause any trouble and had plenty of sugar to send back to Spain, he would be happy. There were 20 families of Jews living in Villa de la Vega, what would become Spanish town, and they went down to the water's edge where they had some docks built in what would one day become Port Royal. There, they waited on and greeted the 30 new families of Portuguese conversos at the dock. Now, we don't know if there was any relation between the new arrivals and those that went down to meet them at the docks. There may have been connections back in Spain that got certain families sent to Jamaica, or they may have all been complete strangers. But in one sense, they were all family. There were now hundreds of people here on Jamaica, all of them Sephardi Jews. They had been persecuted and pushed into hiding back in Iberia, but now they were on an island that belonged to them. There was no one on Jamaica that was threatening to torture them or dominate them or persecute them or force them to convert. I can only imagine what it must have felt like for those 30 families that arrived on Jamaica to realize that they now had a, well, a place of their own. I, I, I can't imagine the sense of relief and the sense of freedom and joy that must have washed over them. When everyone settled in, they did actually establish that sugar plantation that Charles V wanted them to. They set up some modest fortifications using the materials he had sent, and they built up their docks. They chose then to settle down. They wanted to live lives of peace. Many of them had been involved in politics or the military, but now they wanted to live lives far from royal circles and far from war and far from piracy. However, well, actually, let's look forward about a hundred years. Now, those one hundred years were a busy century. During that hundred years, the Mona Lisa was painted, William Shakespeare lived, England went from Protestant to Catholic and then back to Protestant again. France was torn apart by a religious war and then put back together. Francis Drake sailed for the New World, and Queen Elizabeth fought Philip II in the English Channel. But on Jamaica, during that century, very little really changed. There was one big change. Most of the Native Americans on Jamaica died off, and the sugar plantations started employing African slave labor. But other than that, very little changed on Jamaica at least in the Jewish population. They were a much larger population than they had been, and Villa de la Vega was a much larger town than it had been. The Spanish king did eventually send out naval squadrons to the island. Now, mostly they kept to the dockside on the southern part of the island in what would eventually become Port Royal. They were there to guard against pirates. Now, those pirates were mostly Dutch and English, and there were a few problems from nearby Santo Domingo. However, the Jews on Jamaica didn't want anything to do with the Spanish naval squadrons or the pirates. They were happy to keep to themselves. As long as those Spanish squadrons didn't come up and start bothering them and ensured that their sugar shipments were kept safe, they were fine with that. Now, there is a bit of evidence to suggest that the Jews on Jamaica may have traded with or even given aid to some of those very early Huguenot Bucani over on Tortuga, but none of it is conclusive, and in all honesty, it's not even all that compelling. It would make some sense. They would have learned the benefits of trading in cheap goods stolen from Spain, but they were soon to be definitively forced to face the realities of West Indian war and piracy. See, 
a movement was taking shape, a movement to free their religious brethren. If the Jamaican Jewish planters did trade with any pirates, it would certainly have been a very small group of Dutch and English rovers that operated to the southwest from an island just off the Mosquito Coast. That island didn't yet have a name, and most of the pirates that operated from the island were very small-time, just open rowboats. They were looking for easy prizes, nothing too big. But in 1628, those small-time pirates arrived off the north coast of Jamaica. They had bigger ships, they had holds full of silver and gold, and they had stories to tell. Not only did they have stories and money, they had some new friends with them. If we assume that there were merchants that dealt in illicit goods on Jamaica, and we should assume that there were at least a few, well, they were in for a surprise. Those Dutch and English small-time pirates had brought with them a number of pirates that were not so small-time. Many of them were Dutch, some of them were North African, and all of them were Jews. See, the Netherlands was embroiled in a war with Spain, the Eighty Years' War, and these Jews that arrived with these pirates were, well, they were part of that war, but they were fighting a separate fight. They were Iberian, Sephardi, Jewish exiles, just the same as the population of Jamaica, or at least they were all the grandchildren of those original exiles. The difference was that many of their ancestors had fled Spain for Amsterdam or North Africa instead of the New World. When the Dutch sea beggars went to sea against the Spanish, a lot of young Jewish men signed up to help that fight. When the Moorish corsairs set sail against the Spanish in the Mediterranean, a lot of Jews signed up to help them in their fight. And when the Dutch pirates went to go join forces with those Moorish corsairs, a large number of those Jewish Amsterdam pirates went with them. This was turning into a new Jewish revolt against the new Roman Empire. That revolt spread from North Africa to the Netherlands to the North Sea all the way to Brazil. Edward Kritzler calls these young rebels a generation of warriors for Zion. Now, I wonder if any of those warriors for Zion knew that the population of Jamaica was Jewish. The Jamaicans themselves kept it quiet. However, when those warriors found out, they absolutely would have tried to recruit any young men that wanted to fight against Spain to avenge the wrongs done to their grandparents. Now, we don't know the details of any meeting that took place on Jamaica, but surrounding evidence suggests that it did take place. Were these pirates, these warriors for Zion, these rebels, were they brought down to Villa de la Vega to Spanish town, perhaps under cover of darkness, in secret, to tell their story to the town fathers? Did the leaders in Villa de la Vega go out to meet with them? We don't know, but whatever the reality, it influenced the future of Jamaica. You see, these Jews and Dutchmen and Englishmen, the pirates, well, they were all fresh off a fight with the Spanish up to the north near Havana. They had captured... Well, they had captured more than that Italian pirate Giovanni de Verrazzano. Any of the merchants on Jamaica would have been, at the very least, interested to learn how they came by it, and many of the young men and women on Jamaica may have run off to join them. Even if they didn't run off and join them, they would have wanted to. The people of Jamaica probably gave these pirates aid. They probably gave them trade, and they probably gave them shelter. Now, we don't have a record of that. They weren't stupid enough to write it down if they did. But surrounding evidence that we do have suggests that about 1629, there were contacts made between the pirates and those warriors for Zion and the Jews on Jamaica. Even if they didn't send off any of their young people to go fight with the pirates... Well, they were certainly sympathetic to this rebellion. More and more they began to see the benefits, the self-interested benefits, of dealing with these rebels and these pirates. But as time went on, and as those young people grew up and raised new young people, they began to see beyond the self-interested benefits. They began to see the benefits to their people, to their religious brethren, to their brothers and sisters across the world. 
and they saw the opportunity to deal a blow to Spain when the English arrived in 1655. 